Hello, this is Story Man. This is a book that I found to be very worthwhile and that I have long wanted to release as an audiobook. Bushido, The Soul of Japan by Nitobe Inazo. I will divide it up into the various points that Nitobe-san has highlighted and it will be posted in several pieces. Mr. Nitobe was quite well known in Japan and his picture appears on the old 5,000 yen banknote. This book was first written in English and published in New York. The author explains that it was written as an answer to the surprise that there was no religious instruction in Japanese schools and the query that, if that is the case, where does the Japanese high sense of morality come from? He brings out several characteristics of Bushiro which have had a lasting effect on the Japanese people. In particular, rectitude or justice, courage, benevolence, politeness, veracity or honesty, honor, loyalty, and self-control. The book was written and first published in 1899, about 40 years after America's Commodore Perry forced Japan to open its borders to other countries in 1853-58, to and only about 30 years after the Meiji Restoration, in which overall control of Japan was centered on the Emperor. When this book was written, Japan had recently fought a war with China and had taken possession of Taiwan and some islands in the Strait of Taiwan. Japan had not yet invaded China and this book was written before the Japanese imperialism that brought widespread condemnation from the world. As a side note about Taiwan, Although Japanese aggression, especially in China and Korea, left a very sour taste among the people of those countries, in Taiwan, although the people had to submit to Japanese rule and education, most of the people, at least those older ones who are still feeling the effects of that background, feel kindly toward Japan and recognize the advances in infrastructure that were brought about by Japanese rule. This reading of Bushido, The Soul of Japan, is dedicated to my friend, Osamu Kobayashi, who first encouraged me to read the book. Thank you, Osamu. That was very good advice. And now I hope you will enjoy Bushido, The Soul of Japan. Bushido the Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe, A.M., Ph.D. Author's Edition, Revised and Enlarged, 1908. December, 1904. To my beloved uncle, Tokitoshi Oda, who taught me to revere the past and to admire the deeds of the samurai, I dedicate this little book. Over the mountain, which who stands upon is apt to doubt if it be indeed a road, while if he views it from the waist itself, up goes the line there, plain from base to brow, not vague, mistakable. What's a break or two seen from the unbroken desert either side? And then, to bring in fresh philosophy, what if the breaks themselves should prove at last the most consummate of contrivances to train a man's eye, teach him what is faith? Robert Browning, Bishop Blurum's Apology There are, if I may say so, three powerful spirits which have from time to time moved on the face of the waters and given a predominant impulse to the moral sentiments and energies of mankind. 
These are the spirits of liberty, of religion, and of honor. Halam, Europe in the Middle Ages. Chivalry is itself the poetry of life. Schlegel, Philosophy of History. Preface. About ten years ago, while spending a few days under the hospitable roof of the distinguished Belgian jurist, the lamented M. D. Levelle, our conversation turned, during one of our rambles, to the subject of religion. Do you mean to say, asked the venerable professor, that you have no religious instruction in your schools? On my replying in the negative, he suddenly halted in astonishment, and in a voice which I shall not easily forget, he repeated, No religion. How do you impart moral education? The question stunned me at the time. I could give no ready answer, for the moral precepts I learned in my childhood days were not given in schools. And not until I began to analyze the different elements that formed my notions of right and wrong did I find that it was Bushido that breathed them into my nostrils. The direct inception of this little book is due to the frequent queries put by my wife as to the reasons why such and such ideas and customs prevail in Japan. In my attempts to give satisfactory replies to Mr. de Lavallee and to my wife, I found that without understanding feudalism and Bushido, the moral ideas of present Japan are a sealed volume. Taking advantage of enforced idlement on account of long illness, I put down in the order now presented to the public some of the answers given in our household conversation. They consist mainly of what I was taught and told in my youthful days when feudalism was still in force. Between La Fasidio, Hearn, and Mrs. Hugh Fraser on one side, and Sir Ernest Sato and Professor Chamberlain on the other, it is indeed discouraging to write anything Japanese in English. The only advantage I have over them is that I can assume the attitude of a personal defendant, while these distinguished writers are at best solicitors and attorneys. I have often thought, had I their gift of language, I would present the cause of Japan in more eloquent terms. But one who speaks in a borrowed tongue should be thankful if he can just make himself intelligible. All through the discourse I have tried to illustrate whatever points I have made with parallel examples from European history and literature, believing that these will aid in bringing the subject nearer to the comprehension of foreign readers. Should any of my allusions to religious subjects and to religious workers be thought slighting, I trust my attitude towards Christianity itself will not be questioned. It is with ecclesiastical methods and with the forms which obscure the teachings of Christ, and not with the teachings themselves, that I have little sympathy. I believe in the religion taught by him and handed down to us in the New Testament, as well as in the law written in the heart. Further, I believe that God hath made a testament which may be called old with every people and nation, Gentile or Jew, Christian or heathen. As to the rest of my theology, I need not impose upon the patience of the public. In concluding this preface, I wish to express my thanks to my friend Anna C. Hartshorn for many valuable suggestions and for the characteristically Japanese design made by her for the cover of this book. Inazo Nitobe, Malvern, Pennsylvania, 12th month, 1899. Preface to the Tenth and Revised Edition Since its first publication in Philadelphia more than six years ago, this little book has had an unexpected history. The Japanese reprint has passed through eight editions, the present thus being its tenth appearance in the English language. Simultaneously with this will be issued an American and English edition, 
through the publishing house of Mr. George H. Putman's Sons of New York. In the meantime, Bushido has been translated into Marathi by Mr. Dev of Kandesh, into German by Fräulein Kaufmann of Hamburg, into Bohemian by Mr. Hora of Chicago, into Polish by the Society of Science and Life in Lemberg, although this Polish edition has been censured by the Russian government. It is now being rendered into Norwegian and into French. A Chinese translation is under contemplation. A Russian officer, now a prisoner in Japan, has a manuscript in Russian ready for the press. A part of the volume has been brought before the Hungarian public and a detailed review, almost amounting to a commentary, has been published in Japanese. Full scholarly notes for the help of younger students have been compiled by my friend Mr. H. Sakurai, to whom I also owe much for his aid in other ways. I have been more than gratified to feel that my humble work has found sympathetic readers in widely separated circles, showing that the subject matter is of some interest to the world at large. Exceedingly flattering is the news that has reached me from official sources that President Roosevelt has done it undeserved honor by reading it and distributing several dozens of copies among his friends. In making emendations and additions for the present edition, I have largely confined them to concrete examples. I still continue to regret, as I indeed have never ceased to do, my inability to add a chapter on filial piety, which is considered one of the two wheels of the chariot of Japanese ethics, loyalty being the other. My inability is due rather to my ignorance of the Western sentiment in regard to this particular virtue than to ignorance of our own attitude towards it. And I cannot draw comparisons satisfying to my own mind. I hope one day to enlarge upon this and other topics at some length. All the subjects that are touched upon in these pages are capable of further amplification and discussion, but I do not now see my way clear to make this volume larger than it is. This preface would be incomplete and unjust if I were to omit the debt I owe to my wife for her reading of the proof sheets, for helpful suggestions, and above all for her constant encouragement. I. N. Kyoto, 5th month, 22nd, 1905. Bushido as an Ethical System Chivalry is a flower no less indigenous to the soil of Japan than its emblem, the cherry blossom. Nor is it a dried-up specimen of an antique virtue preserved in the herbarium of our history. It is still a living object of power and beauty among us. And if it assumes no tangible shape or form, it not the less scents the moral atmosphere and makes us aware that we are still under its potent spell. The conditions of society which brought it forth and nourished it have long disappeared, but as those far-off stars which once were and are not still continue to shed their rays upon us, so the light of chivalry, which was a child of feudalism, still illuminates our moral path, surviving its mother institution. It is a pleasure to me to reflect upon this subject in the language of Burke, who uttered the well-known touching eulogy over the neglected beer of its European prototype. It argues a sad defect of information concerning the Far East when so erudite a scholar as Dr. George Miller did not hesitate to affirm that chivalry or any other similar institution has never existed either among the nations of antiquity or among the modern Orientals. Such ignorance, however, is amply excusable as the third edition of the good doctor's work appeared the same year that Commodore Perry was knocking at the portals of our exclusivism. More than a decade later, about the time that our feudalism was in the last throes of existence, Karl Marx, writing his Capital, called the attention of his readers to the particular advantage of studying the social and political institutions of feudalism as then to be seen in living form only in Japan. 
I would likewise invite the Western historical and ethical student to the study of chivalry in the Japan of the present. Enticing as is a historical disquisition on the comparison between European and Japanese feudalism and chivalry, it is not the purpose of this paper to enter into it at length. My attempt is rather to relate, firstly, the origin and sources of our chivalry, second, its character and teaching, thirdly, its influence among the masses, and fourthly, the continuity and permanence of its influence. Of these several points, the first will be only brief and cursory, else I should have to take my readers into the devious paths of our national history. The second will be dwelt upon at greater length as being most likely to interest students of international ethics and comparative ethology in our ways of thought and action, and the rest will be dealt with as corollaries. The Japanese word which I have roughly rendered chivalry is, in the original, more expressive than horsemanship. Bushido means literally military knight ways, the ways which fighting nobles should observe in their daily life, as well as in their vocation. In a word, the precepts of knighthood, the noblesse oblige of the warrior class. Having thus given its literal significance, I may be allowed henceforth to use the word in the original. The use of the original term is also advisable for this reason, that a teaching so circumscribed and unique, engendering a cast of mind and character so peculiar, so local, must wear the badge of its singularity on its face. Then, some words have a national timber, so expressive of race characteristics that the best of translators can do them but scant justice, not to say positive injustice and grievance. Who can improve by translation what the German Gemuth signifies? Or who does not feel the difference between the two words verbally so closely allied as the English gentleman and the French gentilhomme? Bushido, then, is the code of moral principles which the knights were required or instructed to observe. It is not a written code. At best, it consists of a few maxims handed down from mouth to mouth or coming from the pen of some well-known warrior or savant. More frequently, it is a code unuttered and unwritten, possessing all the more the powerful sanction of veritable deed and of a law written on the fleshly tablets of the heart. It was founded not on the creation of one brain, however able, or on the life of a single personage, however renowned. It was an organic growth of decades and centuries of military career. It perhaps fills the same position in the history of ethics that the English Constitution does in political history. Yet it has had nothing to compare with the Magna Carta or the Habeas Corpus Act. True, early in the 17th century, military statutes, Bouquet Hato, were promulgated but their thirteen short articles were taken up mostly with marriages, castles, leagues, etc., and didactic regulations were but merely touched upon. We cannot therefore point out any definite time and place and say, here is its fountainhead. Only as it attains consciousness in the feudal age, its origin in respect to time may be identified with feudalism. But feudalism itself is woven of many threads, and Bushido shares its intricate nature. As in England, the political institutions of feudalism may be said to date from the Norman conquest, so we may say that in Japan its rise was simultaneous with the ascendancy of Yoritomo, late in the 12th century. As, however, in England we find the social elements of feudalism far back in the period previous to William the Conqueror, so too the germs of feudalism in Japan had been long existent before the period I have mentioned. Again, in Japan, as in Europe, when feudalism was formally inaugurated, the professional class of warriors naturally came into prominence. These were known as samurai, meaning literally like the old English knecht, guards or attendants, resembling in character the solduri, whom Caesar mentioned as existing in Aquitania, or the Kamitati, 
who, according to Tacitus, followed Germanic chiefs in his time. Or to take a still later parable, the Milites Medii, that one reads about in the history of medieval Europe. A Sinaiko, Japanese word, bouquet or bushi, fighting knights, was also adopted in common use. They were a privileged class and must originally have been a rough breed who made fighting their vocation. This class was naturally recruited in a long period of constant warfare from the manliest and the most adventurous, and all the while the process of elimination went on, the timid and the feeble being sorted out, and only a rude race, all masculine with brutish strength, to borrow Emerson's phrase, surviving to form families and the ranks of the samurai. Coming to profess great honor and great privileges and correspondingly great responsibilities, they soon felt the need of a common standard of behavior, especially as they were always on a belligerent footing and belonged to different clans. Just as physicians limit competition among themselves by professional courtesy, just as lawyers sit in courts of honor in cases of violated etiquette, so must also warriors possess some resort for final judgment on their misdemeanors. Fair play in fight. What fertile germs of morality lie in this primitive sense of savagery and childhood? Is it not the root of all mystery and civic virtues? We smile as if we had outgrown it at the boyish desire of the small Britisher Tom Brown to leave behind him the name of a fellow who never bullied a little boy or turned his back on a big one. And yet who does not know that this desire is the cornerstone on which moral structures of mighty dimensions can be reared? May I not go even so far as to say that the gentlest and most peace-loving of religions endorses this aspiration? This desire of Tom's is the basis on which the greatness of England is largely built, and it will not take us long to discover that Bushido does not stand on a lesser pedestal. If fighting in itself, be it offensive or defensive, is, as Quakers rightly testify, brutal and wrong, we can still say with Lessing, we know from what failings our virtue springs. Sneaks and cowards are epithets of the worst opprobrium to healthy, simple natures. Childhood begins life with these notions, and knighthood also. But as life grows larger and its relations many-sided, the early faith seeks sanction from higher authority and more rational sources for its own justification, satisfaction, and development. If military interests had operated alone, without higher moral support, how far short of chivalry would the ideal of knighthood have fallen? In Europe, Christianity, interpreted with concessions convenient to chivalry, infused it nevertheless with spiritual data. Religion, war, and glory were the three souls of a perfect Christian knight, says Lamartine. In Japan, there were several Sources of Bushido, of which I may begin with Buddhism. It furnished a sense of calm trust in fate, a quiet submission to the inevitable, that stoic composure in sight of danger or calamity, that disdain of life and friendliness with death. A foremost teacher of swordsmanship, when he saw his pupil master the utmost of his art, told him, Beyond this, my instruction must give way to Zen teaching. Zen is the Japanese equivalent for the dhyana, which represents human effort to reach through meditation zones of thought beyond the range of verbal expression. Its method is contemplation, and its purport, as far as I understand it, to be convinced of a principle that underlies all phenomena, and, if it can, of the Absolute itself, and thus to put oneself in harmony with this Absolute. Thus to find the teaching was more than the dogma of a sect, and whoever attains to the perception of the Absolute 
raises himself above mundane things and awakes to a new heaven and a new earth. What Buddhism failed to give, Shintoism offered in abundance. Such loyalty to the sovereign, such reverence for ancestral memory, and such filial piety as are not taught by any other creed were inculcated by the Shinto doctrines, imparting passivity to the otherwise arrogant character of the samurai. Shinto theology has no place for the dogma of original sin. On the contrary, it believes in the innate goodness and godlike purity of the human soul, adoring it as the aditum from which divine oracles are proclaimed. Everybody has observed that the Shinto shrines are conspicuously devoid of objects and instruments of worship, and that a plain mirror hung in the sanctuary forms the essential part of its furnishing. The presence of this article is easy to explain. It typifies the human heart, which, when perfectly placid and clear, reflects the very image of the deity. When you stand, therefore, in front of the shrine to worship, you see your own image reflected on its shining surface, and the act of worship is tantamount to the old Delphic injunction, Know thyself. But self-knowledge does not imply, either in the Greek or Japanese teaching, knowledge of the physical part of man, not his anatomy or his psychophysics. Knowledge was to be of a moral kind, the introspection of our moral nature. Momsen, comparing the Greek and the Roman, says that when the former worshipped, he raised his eyes to heaven for his prayer was contemplation, while the latter veiled his head for his was reflection. Essentially like the Roman conception of religion, our reflection brought into prominence not so much the moral as the national consciousness of the individual. Its nature worship endeared the country to our inmost souls, while its ancestor worship, tracing from lineage to lineage, made the imperial family the fountainhead of the whole nation. To us, the country is more than land and soil from which to mine gold or to reap grain. It is the sacred abode of the gods, the spirits of our forefathers. To us, the emperor is more than the arch-constable of a Reichstag, or even the patron of a Kulturstadt. He is the bodily representative of heaven on earth, blending in his person its power and its mercy. If what Mr. Botme says is true of English royalty, that it is not only the image of authority but the author and symbol of national unity, as I believe it to be, Doubly and trebly may this be affirmed of royalty in Japan. The tenets of Shintoism cover the two predominating features of the emotional life of our race, patriotism and loyalty. Arthur May Knapp very truly says, In Hebrew literature it is often difficult to tell whether the writer is speaking of God or of the commonwealth, of heaven, or of Jerusalem, of the Messiah, or of the nation itself. A similar confusion may be noticed in the nomenclature of our national faith. I said confusion because it will be so deemed by a logical intellect on account of its verbal ambiguity, still being a framework of national instinct and race feelings. Shintoism never pretends to a systematic philosophy or a rational theology. This religion... Or is it not more correct to say the race emotions which this religion expressed? Thoroughly imbued Bushido with loyalty to the sovereign and love of country. These acted more as impulses than as doctrines, for Shintoism, unlike the medieval Christian church, prescribed to its votaries scarcely any credenda, furnishing them at the same time with agenda of a straightforward and simple type. As to strictly ethical doctrines, the teachings of Confucius were the most prolific source of Bushido. His enunciation of the five moral relations between master and servant, the governing and the governed, father and son, husband and wife, older and younger brother, 
and between friend and friend was but a confirmation of what the race instinct had recognized before his writings were introduced from China. The calm, benignant, and worldly-wise character of his political-ethical precepts was particularly well-suited to the samurai who formed the ruling class. His aristocratic and conservative tone was well adapted to the requirements of these warrior statesmen. Next to Confucius, Mencius exercised an immense authority over Bushido. His forcible and often quite democratic theories were exceedingly taking to sympathetic natures, and they were even thought dangerous to and subversive of the existing social order. Hence his works were for a long time under censure. Still, the words of this master mind found permanent lodgment in the heart of the samurai. The writings of Confucius and Mencius formed the principal textbooks for youths and the highest authority in discussion among the old. A mere acquaintance with the classics of these two sages was held, however, in no high esteem. A common proverb ridicules one who has only an intellectual knowledge of Confucius as a man ever studious but ignorant of Analects. A typical samurai calls a literary savant a book-smelling sot. Another compares learning to an ill-smelling vegetable that must be boiled and boiled before it is fit for use. A man who has read a little smells a little pedantic, and a man who has read much smells yet more so. Both are alike unpleasant. The writer meant thereby that knowledge becomes really such only when it is assimilated in the mind of the learner and shows in his character. An intellectual specialist was considered a machine. Intellect itself was considered subordinate to ethical emotion. Man and the universe were conceived to be alike spiritual and ethical. Bushido could not accept the judgment of Huxley that the cosmic process was unmoral. Bushido made light of knowledge as such. It was not pursued as an end in itself, but as a means to the attainment of wisdom. Hence, he who stopped short of this end was regarded no higher than a convenient machine which could turn out poems and maxims at bidding. Thus, knowledge was conceived as identical with its practical application in life. And this Socratic doctrine found its greatest exponent in the Chinese philosopher Wan Yang Ming, who never wearies of repeating, to know and to act are one and the same. I beg leave for a moment's digression while I am on this subject, inasmuch as some of the noblest types of Bushi were strongly influenced by the teachings of this sage. Western readers will easily recognize in his writings many parallels to the New Testament, making allowance for the terms peculiar to either teaching. The passage, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you, conveys a thought that may be found on almost any page of Wan Yang Ming. A Japanese disciple of his says, The Lord of heaven and earth, of all living beings dwelling in the heart of man, becomes his mind, Kokoro. Hence, a mind is a living thing and is ever luminous. And again, the spiritual light of our essential being is pure and is not affected by the will of man. Spontaneously springing up in our mind, it shows what is right and wrong. It is then called conscience. It is even the light that proceedeth from the God of heaven. How very much do these words sound like some passages from Isaac Pennington or other philosophic mystics. I am inclined to think that the Japanese mind, as expressed in the simple tenets of the Shinto religion, was particularly open to the reception of Yan Ming's precepts. He carried his doctrine of the infallibility of conscience to extreme transcendentalism, attributing to it the faculty to perceive not only the distinction between right and wrong, but also the nature of psychical facts and physical phenomena. He went as far as, if not farther then, Berkeley and Fichte in idealism, denying the existence of things outside of human kin. If his system had all the logical errors charged to solipsism, 
it had all the efficacy of strong conviction, and its moral import in developing individuality of character and equanimity of temper cannot be gainsaid. Thus, whatever the sources, the essential principles which Bushido imbibed from them and assimilated to itself were few and simple. Few and simple as these were, they were sufficient to furnish a safe conduct of life even through the unsafest days of the most unsettled period of our nation's history. The wholesome, unsophisticated nature of our warrior ancestors derived ample food for their spirit from a sheaf of commonplace and fragmentary teachings, gleaned as it were on the highways and byways of ancient thought, and stimulated by the demands of the age, formed from these gleanings a new and unique type of manhood. An acute French savant, Monsieur de la Mausolière, thus sums up his impressions of the 16th century. Toward the middle of the 16th century, all is confusion in Japan, in the government, in society, in the church. But the civil wars, the manners returning to barbarism, the necessity for each to execute justice for himself, these formed men comparable to those Italians of the 16th century in whom Taine praises the vigorous initiative, the habit of sudden resolutions and desperate undertakings, the grand capacity to do and to suffer. In Japan, as in Italy, the rude manners of the Middle Ages made of men a superb animal, wholly militant and wholly resistant. And this is why the 16th century displays in the highest degree the principal quality of the Japanese race, that great diversity which one finds there between minds, esfoi, as well as between temperaments. While in India, and even in China, men seem to differ chiefly in degree of energy or intelligence, in Japan they differ by originality of character as well. Now, individuality is the sign of superior races and of civilizations already developed. If we make use of an expression dear to Nietzsche, we might say that in Asia to speak of humanity is to speak of its planes. In Japan, as in Europe, one represents it above all by its mountains. <laughs>